Good morning to day two of the Global Investigative Journalism uh, Conference. Uh, I'm your moderator this morning. My name is Jan Gunnar Furli. I'm from the Norwegian Association for Investigative Reporting. And I'm, I'm a news reporter with the, the largest daily in Norway, Aftenposten. Uh, like 10 years ago, I was the chairman of the Norwegian Environmental Journalist, so I've been covering uh, environmental journalism for a long period. Uh, the topic here is uh, uh, cutting edge environmental reporting. Uh, We're going to have a showcase on some of the most important stories on our globe. With us, we have um, to the right, uh, Mark Shapiro. He's a contributor to the um, Center for Investigative Reporting in California. He's right now on book leave. He publishes uh, articles in different magazines like, the, like Harbors, Atlantic, um, also Mother Jones, and he does radio and TV stuff uh, about environmental journalism. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, Gustavo uh, Faleros. He's a Knight International Journalism Fellow. Uh, last June, they Last year in June, they started um, Info Amazonia, a website which is uh, mapping uh, the changes of our uh, ecosystem. And he will talk about uh, geo journalism telling stories via maps. And uh, the third journalist is from India, uh, Shubra Priyadarshini. She's the editor of Nature India. Yesterday, when I talked to her, she was very worried because her parents were in the eye of the extreme cyclone Fallin in India, in Orissa. And um, there were, it had a landfall yesterday, and, uh, but this morning you were able to talk to your parents. They are well. Uh, there is no electricity. Uh, there's a lot of consequences of this uh, cyclone. So I will introduce first to the podium uh, Shubra. Uh, you will tell about how you discovered some vanishing islands in the delta, uh, the Ganges Delta. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Subra, and I will be talking to you about the vanishing islands of Sundarbans in the West Bengal region of India. Uh, I work out of New Delhi, and just to give you a brief idea about where we're talking about, yeah, it's in the eastern part of India these islands are, and can I just take it out? Yeah. Okay, the story that I'm going to talk about is the vanishing islands of Sundarbans. Uh, the story was broken in 2006. So the main story appeared in a newspaper called The Telegraph in West Bengal. That's the largest circulated daily there. And it talked about how some islands in the Sundarbans were actually going down into the sea. This was the first ever reported incidence of whole islands going under the sea due to sea level rise, which is, uh, as we all know, a consequence of uh, climate change across the world. So 
That's the story, and we got a huge spread in the science supplement of the newspaper, which is called the Know How. So you had the uh, front page story and a huge splash in the inside of the paper. And this was in 2006. This year, we revisited the story again, uh, and this was for Nature India, uh, the, the uh, online platform that I currently work for. So we tried to find out in all these years, how has life changed for the people who live in the Sundarbans Island? So what is the scene like? What are we talking about here? We're talking about the Indo-Bangladesh border, and uh, it's almost about 9,000 square kilometers of mangrove. This is the world's largest mangroves. And it spreads across the India and Bangladesh border there. And we have a very gorgeous mangrove islands in here, which is almost about 100 odd islands. And the conglomerate spans the Indo-Bangladesh border, as I told you. And it is one of the UN heritage sites because of the massive biodiversity that it, that it holds within these islands. These are the world's only mangrove tiger lands, which means you get the Royal Bengal tiger, which is again a, again a big, big attraction of these islands. So it's one of the most protected places in the whole world, but in there, the islands were sinking. So, uh, the story first unfolded to me when I was visiting the islands. It was a casual visit. I was just about uh, there between jobs, uh, so taking a break into the islands, because it's a lovely place. And uh, so, uh, I was there, I was talking to the locals, some of the locals, and uh, we found that many of the locals actually did not belong to those uh, islands that they were living in. So they're almost like close to 100 islands, and almost like 80 are inhabited, 20 aren't. So uh, the, the main island that I was visiting was called Sagar, and there we found that a lot of people were not actually from that island. So their ancestors had moved into these islands, but there was no official record for these people who had moved from the other islands. They were just there, right? They were just identity-less people who had no identities, who, who were not marked in the official record. They were just living in another island from a neighboring island. So uh, we probed, I probed, and one of my friends, we probed a little further and found out that the uh, government records did not have much to help us, and so we did the next best thing, and we scanned some historic records of the islands, from where we found that, yes, there was indeed a, a, a large-scale migration from one or two islands which were uh, close to these islands. So we went into doing a little more detailed study about it, and we thought that we should resort to science more than anecdotes, you know, about pe hearing people say we were from so-and-so island and our island has, is no more there. So we went into a little science, and it looked like science was the best tool to use to unravel the story. And at this point of time, I happened to meet an oceanography expert in a local university who was doing a lot of work on these islands for years together without actually bringing that out, bringing that work out in, uh, in a scientific journal or in any presentation or uh, to, the, uh, to the knowledge of the government, local government. So I met this man called Sugato Hajra, Professor Sugato Hajra, who is an oceanography expert at the Jadapur University, which is in Calcutta, uh, West Bengal. And he had compiled a series of maps over the years. And he had published a small paper in a very lesser known journal which not many people read. So the 
the evidence was piecing together, it was coming out clearer that indeed there were two islands in these these hundred odd. Actually, there are hundred two islands in in the government records. But when we went into looking at the satellite pictures, which I'll come to uh, in a while, uh, there were only hundred visible. So where had these two whole islands gone? They were nowhere in the records in the government. Uh, books. They were nowhere in the in the satellite pictures. So where had they gone? So we were asking these questions to more and more people around, visiting them, making more anecdotal, uh, uh, taking more anecdotal accounts into consideration, and a lot of field trips inside the uh, islands. So what happened as a result of all this all this investigation? We also approached a lot of government people during the investigation. So the first thing that happened was denial. They said that there was no submergence at all in these islands and that the islands did not exist. I mean, I mean, they did exist, but they did not exist in the government records. So we wanted to find out what exactly was the reason behind this denial. And we saw that if they were to, they were to confirm that these islands had actually gone down and that these people were refugees, they had to give them a status of refugees, the status of refugees, and accord some rights to them according to what the refugee rights demands. So that was why the, the, the initial uh, denial came through from the government. And they said that there was no climate change. They said that there was, uh, these uh, islands were uh, it was natural to have uh, land erosion and accretion. It was a natural phenomenon and that there was no evidence of sea level rise in these islands. So I must take you through a little bit of political background of the state here. Uh, the state is called West Bengal. It's in, eastern part, it's in the eastern part of India. And it's, uh, it was run by a communist government. So they were there for almost like 30 years ruling the state and it was almost like an autocracy. So whatever they said was the final word and however they wanted to manipulate the records was their way of doing uh, scientific uh, recording of data. So, so there was no data uh, as such scientifically compiled on the fragile ecosystem of these islands. And um, what we then did was based on all this evidence that we had, we published the story that I sh showed to you in a while, uh, a while back. Um, uh, so we published that story, and that story was followed up immediately by the international media, which was big, big islands going down into the sea, and it was the first recorded incident. So it was, it was like the BBC was there, the Guardian was there, New York Times was there. So the, uh, the entire gamut of international uh, media was descending on those islands, doing those stories, picking up more anecdotal evidences, picking up more scientific evidence from uh, across the world, and building up the case, as it were, for, uh, for a huge science story there, huge environment story there. And then, immediately after that, the BBC chose this story of mine for an award, and so it actually went bigger, and it it actually went across uh, to a lot, a lot more people. And I thought that that buzz and that pressure actually forced the government to do a relook and to accept climate change as a reality in Sundarbans as opposed to they're saying that, you know, oh, it's just land accretion and erosion earlier. So the West Bengal state, when I went back this year to do the revisit story, it had actually published an action plan on climate change and uh, the underlying threat to the Delta, and it was released earlier this year. So that was the impact of the story. So uh, now I'll talk to you a little bit about how we use science as the investigative tool here. That is the gentleman, Sugato Hajra, explaining to me the, the uh, erosion and accretion of the islands. This is compiled from uh, years of satellite data. As you can see, the, the island area in 1969, I don't think that's too clear there, but 
the, uh, the green is the island area in 1969, and the yellow is the island area in 2001. So, as you can see, there's uh, two islands there, small islands, Bedford and Lohatara. Those are the two islands that are completely green on the satellite maps. So there's no land there, so which means they're right under the sea now. You can't see any islands if you go there. And the rest of these islands are also under the threat of submergence over the years. So it's sort of being estimated that if nothing is done to the mangroves, to these islands, then within maybe 50 more years, you'll see a lot more green in those maps. So across the Sundaban Islands, as you see, there are two islands already gone there, and uh, the Bhangadwani Island here is a uh, large part of it is already under the sea. The Ghoramarla Island on top there, uh, there's a little bit left of the island, but most of it is under the sea. So one example of land erosion and accretion uh, here is uh, the accretional data is in green, as you can see and the erosional data is in red. So, which means that the erosion is far more than the accretion here. And these are all satellite data compiled by the School of Oceanography Studies, Jadhapur University, uh, now when we started working together on the story. And this is uh, satellite data from the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO. So as I was talking about Loha, uh, the Ghoramara Island, uh, you can see that 9,000 square kilometers is already uh, under sea, and the remaining 5,340 uh, is over the sea. This is 2001, so uh, uh, if you have uh, more later uh, uh, satellite data, you can just Google uh, and see satellite data, and they'll show you what exactly is the uh, amount uh, uh, of land, the, the, the area of land still over uh, the sea. And then uh, we took a lot of anecdotal stories from the islands to find out how land had been submerged in these two islands. Now this is one of my favorite pictures, this little boy taking a bath in a bucket. And it was actually picked up by a lot of international uh, papers as well. I shot that picture and it shows uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the lack of fresh water in these islands. So people bathe, in, bathe their kids in the bucket and they use the same water to, uh, to feed it in their fields for the crops, to irrigate the crops. What was the impact? As you can see, uh, there are, there's housing now for the refugees uh, uh, and lots of such huts have been built in those islands. There's a ferry service. There's this gentleman on the ferry um, to, the, uh, to the neighboring islands to rescue more people who might want shelter uh, out of their islands going down the sea. So there, there are regular ferry services. And I love this kid. Uh, I plan to revisit the islands once more in, say, five, seven, ten years when this kid would be maybe older and would have his own children maybe. <laughs> I don't know. They get married very young in these islands. So... <laughs> So um, I have saved this picture to remind me in 10 years' time to go back to the islands and find out what's happening. And um, here's a tip sheet of uh, what to do in case you're using science as an investigative tool to approach a story like this. Peer review is very important in science, very important in the sense when scientists themselves ratify a work done by a peer in a journal, that becomes gold standard. So no government, no United Nations, nobody can actually challenge that work uh, immediately if you have had peer review of science done. So yes, it is important, but not everything. Uh, please get all sides of the story, like like we did uh, going to the islands, talking to the people over and over again about their experiences, 
get to the NGOs, get to politicians, get to companies and affected people uh, to, to gather more data. Of course, you all know that. And um, the sources for a science-based story are one, uh, peer reviews, uh, conferences, lab reports, many of which we used to find out soil accretion and, uh, and uh, erosion in the islands. Uh, national communications, because this became, this story became part of the national communication of India to the United Nations. They cited this story when they talked about climate change in Sundarbans. So national communications is a very key area where you can find out more about such stories. Uh, email alerts, of course, you know. And um, the unions of scientists and uh, their associations, there are lots of disgruntled scientists out there who are doing a lot of work, but maybe not getting that kind of exposure to, to show their work around. Uh, so if you talk to them, you get a lot of leads into what is happening and what is being curbed down by the local government. So if you talk to them, you get leads, and you then go around exploring those leads. Some of them might be good. Some of them might be sham. I mean, they would be disgruntled because they don't have funds, maybe. But um, most of them turn out to be very good story tips. And um, how do you deal with statistics, data, data sheets, and images? Uh, because geologists, like we saw here, uh, we have a time gap of 1969 to 2001. So it's a huge time, and you actually have to have uh, the, the uh, satellite images compiled over those many years. So that is a bit of uh, a challenge. So how do you prove from satellite images whether, whether there's land there, whether there's sea there, whether whatever, there's forest uh, that, have, uh, uh, that were there and not any more there because of urbanization or whatever. So um, what do you do? You take help from somebody who knows, somebody who's, uh, who's actually done work on satellites, which is what we did there to create those graphics. And um, then you, of course, humanize those numbers and figures, like we did with the, uh, the color coding uh, to show how much land is there, how much isn't there. So it becomes easier for a person uh, uh, like you and me to understand those figures those percentages, those averages, those rates, those century data and satellite figures. And, of course, so let us all stay away from pseudoscience. That's something I keep saying to everybody who's doing a science story. There's a lot of pseudoscience being, being marketed, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, being put across to you as real science. But, uh, uh, as I said, peer review is a gold standard that you can, you can use to find out if it's real science or not. And there are some more um, like that, those, those standards. Um, and, to, uh, and these are two handy lists that, that are there on your screen um, uh, of how to find out what science is reliable. So if you go to those two uh, links, you'll actually find that there's a list of journals uh, curated by, uh, by, by certain people which are uh, supposed to be very high-end, very good science uh, journals. And of course, science policy papers from national governments, from the United Nations, from, the, uh, from NGOs, uh, act as uh, very good reference points, very good uh, areas from where you can pick up uh, a lot of science stories. And of course, uh, that's the link on the best practices of using science for investigative journalism. That's done by the World Federation of Science Journalists. It's an open course. You can take the course, and there are modules and all that. So that, I think, is an excellent source where you can find a lot of such stories. Thank you for your time and patience. Um, I guess your presentation will be available on the uh, website of the conference afterwards. Yeah. Okay, we'll proceed to Mark Shapiro. He's an um, expert on the trade in carbon emissions, uh, which is a market with a lot of bogus stuff. Uh, come on.
try to actually you have to put the mic. Yeah. All right. There. How's that? Okay, great. Very nice to see you all here. I'm glad we're all here. Um, and um, uh, it looks like sort of a prayer meeting hall out there somehow. Um, I uh, and it's just talk. I don't really have a PowerPoint here. Um, and I think uh, my colleagues on the panel um, are going to go into very specific deep dives, as Super just did, very interesting report on kind of like the science and reporting on science. I want to get into sort of some broad uh, conceptual ideas on how to think about environmental reporting. So basically, I've been doing this a long time, for like, Jesus, uh, a couple decades, really. And, um, and one of the things, number one, about environmental reporting that I think is and I don't have to tell any of you, is just obviously we're talking about the environment, which we all share, so we all presumably care about it. Um, and let's face it, there's also another aspect to it, which is the ultimate, I see it as the, it's the ultimate multidisciplinary journalistic approach. To actually begin to master environmental uh, investigations, I think you actually have to think on multiple tracks at the same time. Because actually, ultimately, environmental stories are at least four very... Uh, serious components to every good environmental story. And that means every uh, environmental story is essentially a story about crime. It's a story about money, finance. Of course, it's a story about uh, uh, science. And of course, I think uh, most, if not all, environmental stories ultimately have some international component to them which sends them to the global dimension because, of course, either we share the same problems in our different countries or actually my situation in my country is contributing to the situation in your country. So I think actually to begin to think globally is very important. So I kind of want to go through uh, step by step um, some of the thinking on that score. Um, a couple of years ago, I... Um, I had actually gotten to know a, a couple of some uh, policemen who are uh, associated with uh, Interpol, the International Police Agency, Interpol. And um, Interpol had a very interesting gathering. It was in Lyon. It was a couple of years ago. And the idea of the gathering was actually to bring um, together uh, policemen and women uh, from around the world who were charged with enfor uh, enforcing environmental crimes, who were actually the cops who enforced uh, CITES, who enforced uh, illegal timber laws, uh, laws about uh, the timber trade. Um, and the Basel Convention, which probably most of you know, has to do with hazardous waste. And they wanted for the first time to bring together financial cops. So they were bringing together fraud uh, experts in, in financial fraud, both in the city of London and from uh, from the Netherlands and from different parts of the European Union, the United States. And so for the first time, you had this incredible summit of environmental cops who were like on the front lines in Asia and Africa and, uh, and elsewhere in Latin America, uh, meeting these, these guys who sat in offices analyzing the money flows of international uh, money laundering operations and uh, fraud operations. And so I was, I, uh, uh, I was enabled to attend this conference because I'd done some writing, which I'll tell you about later, about the international carbon markets, which, uh, which Interpol was suddenly waking up to as a possible source of enormous fraud. But one of the things that uh, really struck me at that time when I met uh, and I was there, uh, first of all, you have to imagine the scene. I don't know if you've ever, my first and only time I've ever been to Interpol, which is, of course, in Lyon, France. And uh, the headquarters of Interpol, you know, behind 15, you know, fences and six guards and guys with rifles guarding the place in the middle of Lyon, um, is this marble atrium. And in this marble atrium, very kind of echoes, kind of like this, you know, airplane hangar we're in here. Um, and uh, in this kind of marble atrium where these cops are coming in from all over the world and et cetera, et cetera, there's a big... Uh, on the marble floor, there's a big heap of electronic trash in the Interpol headquarters. And it's old computer parts and old copper wiring and all this kind of crud from the electronic universe. And that's because Interpol enforces the Basel Convention. It has to do with hazardous waste. And so this is a testament. It's like a conceptual artwork in the middle of the Interpol office. very startling to see. Um, next to this pile of electronic waste 
I spoke with a, uh, a, uh, a Dutch policeman who was for the first time meeting his environmental uh, uh, colleague in the business. And one of the things he told me, I asked him, he's a fraud, he's a financial fraud uh, expert in the Dutch uh, National Police. And I asked him what his, how he perceived his job, first time for him in Interpol, first time meeting all these environmental uh, uh, people. He'd previously been on the homicide squad in, uh, in the Netherlands. And he said, well, we are here because we are trying to prevent murder in the future, is what he said. And I've actually never forgotten that. Uh, articulation. That was about a couple of years ago, and it was actually incredible to hear from a cop telling you that um, that essentially his job is to pre is to try to prevent murder in the future. And I think that that when we think about it that way, that of course is it, it, in, in many ways at the core of environmental journalism. We are trying to prevent murder in the future. It may not be a, a literal murder of an individual, but it's the murder of a system of ecological support that sustains us all. And uh, in some cases, it actually is murder. And so his, that articulation, I think, is actually a very powerful concept to keep in mind as we go into this, um, uh, we all pursue this, this field. Um, and of course, one of the fundamental uh, questions there is how do you hold uh, uh, those uh, who are responsible for these murders accountable? And in many cases, the legal system cannot hold them accountable, but we journalists can. I think that's a very important thing to uh, remember. So we, uh, like a cop, let's take environmental uh, investigations as crime stories. So very much like a cop, we have to think like a cop. We have to think where are the fingerprints, where is the evidence that actually is going to lead us down the trail of whatever particular uh, uh, violation it is that we're looking at. I think actually, of course, um, we've got actually, and, and I'm giving a really a broad approach here, obviously, uh, but um, uh, there are a number of new laws actually happening all over the world. It's really interesting. I think environmental laws are actually in countries all over the world are, are I don't know if they're enforcing them, but certainly they're on the books more and more. Uh, uh, environmental laws, what's particularly interesting in uh, the U.S., Europe, and, um, and Canada are new laws requiring disclosure, disclosure of uh, resource companies' payments to foreign governments. I hope all of you are aware of that because this is going to basically start releasing some really interesting information, I think, to all of us uh, as they really come online, which is essentially within the next year. These are all coming online in Europe, the United States, and Canada, and you can start seeing who's paying whom in whatever country it is. That's a, uh, one great way to establish a fingerprint, in, in, certainly in the mining industry. Um, and of course, I don't need to tell you a million times, you know, you need to kind of understand your topic. I always say just try to uh, uh, find out what the people you're looking at are thinking about. What are they, what are they, what are they thinking about? How, what are the kind of strategies that underlie their particular activity? I, I want to um, also stress um, because you see this rock up here, and I want to explain why this rock is here. Um, in many cases, because we're journalists and we're not policemen, we don't actually have to prove a criminal activity. We have to prove a violation of essential environmental principles, but we don't have to prove a criminal activity. And in some instances, uh, we can have, part of our story could actually be why something that's been pursued is not a crime. Why is it not a crime? And um, which brings us to this rock. And I'm going to tell you a little, a little story about this rock. Um, this rock comes from a comes from, this is a, I'm holding up a black rock, as you can see. It's actually a rock about the size of my fist. And this rock happens to be covered with oil. You can still feel the oil in this rock. And this rock, I, I've carried with me now uh, from the uh, beaches of, uh, from a beach, particular beach in uh, northwest Spain, in uh, Galicia. And some of you have been there, know it's a beautiful part of Spain. 
Um, and on off the coast of this beach was a oil tanker that sank called the Prestige. And some of you might remember that. Certainly it was a big deal in uh, Europe. Uh, it got one little small story in the New York Times. I was living in New York at that time. And um, it was not a big story in uh, the United States. It was a huge story, of course, in Europe. And, of course, was the worst uh, environmental disaster essentially in European history compared to – there was Cervezo, a few other ones, but in terms of the uh, oil spill, massive oil spill. Tens of thousands of ga tons of oil were spilled along a 1,000 miles of coastline along the Galician coast and all the way up to southwest France. And the um, – what was interesting about that sinking of that ship – I'm not just interesting, repulsive – but as a story, what was interesting was that the um, – I woke up in the morning in uh, New York, and I always picked up the Times, and I read the Times on my way to work, and, it, you know, like everybody <laughs> reads their, their hometown paper. It used to be my hometown paper. I mean, now it's the world's paper. But um, anyway, I read the New York Times that morning, and I saw a little announcement of, a, of, a, of an oil tanker having sunk off the coast of Spain. And, I, and it was a small little story on page 16 in the inside of the paper. And I thought, well, that's weird. Why, how does this, how does, what, why this oil tanker? Why at this time? It's registered in the Bahamas. Why is it registered in the Bahamas if it's a Greek, if it's a Greek family registered in the Bahamas? And that question basically sent me on a quest, which ultimately landed me uh, uh, on, the ro on the beach where I picked up this rock. And I've never, I've, I've carried this rock with me now for many years, and I put it on my desk. Uh, right above my writing space, because I actually kind of want to remember what we are talking about when we talk about environmental destruction. And I can hold this rock in my hand, and I can smell the gas fumes coming off of this incredible, this pristine beach in Spain that's absolutely in the middle of nowhere. It's uh, uh, kind of a harsh beach, not a swimming beach. And there in the middle of uh, the Atlantic, right off the Atlantic, you can smell the gasoline coming off this uh, place. And this was about a year or so after the accident. So the, the, the point of this, of this story about the rock is because I, like any journalist, ask a question. I actually think every good journalism story starts with a question. It's also, some people call it a hypothesis. I call it a question. I assume you're basically familiar with that process. But one simple question can set you on a journey that's going to open up doors, that's going to lead you down a path. And the question's got to be a good question. And if there's anything I can actually stress, I would say basically come up with a really good question, a question that's not necessarily precise, but that's broad enough and intriguing enough that it's going to open doors for you in terms of your thinking. Because part of the approach here of environmental uh, reporting, as in good reporting, is your thinking. It's how you conceive of a story and how you go about answering Because I think you basically all are all good reporters if you're here, so you basically know the basic steps. And uh, my question in this case, of course, was, um, was why was this ship on this day sinking off a coast that thousands of other ships basically pass by every day? And why was it registered in the Bahamas if it's owned by Greeks? And the, uh, the answer to that question ultimately led to a major investigation that I did uh, which, which ultimately aired on Frontline World, which is a PBS TV news magazine, uh, in which uh, – but, but before I get to that, the results of that investigation, which I'll tell you in a minute, very important things. I knew nothing about the maritime industry at that time, absolutely nothing. I can't even stand being on a ship. I get seasick. I was dreading having to go on a ship in this story, so I did everything I could to not go actually on a ship at sea. Uh, but um, – but I knew that there was, uh, there was something weird about the idea that you had flags in the Bahamas and you had the registration in one place and a registration somewhere else. It sounds like a classic kind of offshore uh, company operation. So I went about just immersing myself in the maritime world, which any of you can do, and you can do it from your own home. You could do it. Uh, there's a website. I'm gonna, uh, I have a list of tips which I'll put on the Internet. We can't get the Internet here, but you have. Am I okay in time? Yeah. So... Um, um, anyway, immerse yourself in the material. Figure out what the maritime journals are. Of course, this is the case for all of you in your different stories. I'm not saying every story is a ship story. Um, use your kind of 
uh, multiple email addresses to get trial subscriptions if you if you don't want to pay, which most of us don't. Um, and um, but the question was essentially who was responsible for this ship sinking. So this story became a question of the black hole at the heart of the liability question because of course it turned out that the Prestige boat that sank off the coast of Spain was um, registered in the Bahamas. Why? The Bahamas has no maritime inspectors, so basically it's not inspected. Two, it was it's the, the legal ownership, and this is uh, this applies to all of you basically. If you're ever going to do something about shipping, the legal ownership. Where do you think the legal ownership of the Prestige was physically existing? Well, if you ever go to Liberia, if you ever go to the capital of Liberia, you go to a city called Monrovia, which is the capital of Liberia, of course, and uh, you can go to a precise address, which is 80 Broad Street on, uh, in Monrovia, and uh, there you will find the registration forms for two-thirds of the oil tankers on the open seas today. And, and why are they registered in Liberia? Well, they're registered in Liberia because in Liberia you can register what's called a one-ship company, which means... You, you're your company. You're, in this case, the Prestige was owned by a very wealthy Greek family. They had about uh, 10 uh, ships. Each ship was registered independently as its own company. So when the Prestige sank, all the assets were at the bottom of the sea. There was no money that could ever be gotten by the owners of the ship. And so that story became a story essentially about the, um, the, uh, the lack of a crime. It was a crime, but nobody could be prosecuted for that crime. And I raise that point because, I mean, part of what we do is actually illustrate why uh, 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 the impact that, that, that such environmental disasters have on us, but oftentimes they are not a crime. And in the case of the Prestige, um, it was not a crime because of a very organized system designed to insulate owners from accountability. And so I think that's a legitimate story to pursue, and you can apply that to any kind of corporate abuse of the environment. Think of it as a story both about the abuse, but also the ways in which the system are set up to prevent liability. So, um, quickly, gonna, um, yeah. uh, uh, I want to go through the three other major components to environmental stories, and um, science. Environmental stories are science stories. Understand the science. Learn how, to org le learn how to understand and read scientific journals. Cannot uh, just explain this very clearly, how important he works for a scientific journal, but also the importance of actually relying on scientific evidence. This is about science. So if you're doing a story about a chemical, a substance, whatever it is, a pollution, read the journals, and you can get them. You just put your Google search in, you'll get some of the best uh, material out of those scientific journals and spend the time to understand what they say. Because often in the abstract of a journal, if you're thinking like a journalist, which presumably you are, um, you're going to be able to see in every scientific journal there is the essence of conflict. Every scientific article there is the essence of conflict, and it may be literally a conflict, in which case, for example, findings about a chemical contamination may be countering the, understand, the, the claims of the chemical industry, or it may be a conceptual conflict, in which case the scientist is taking a very different position than the mainstream science community on a particular question. But if you train yourself to read those journals with an eye on the conflict, you will find them. And um, I can mention a, uh, a few, and, and, and it's, um, it's um, and I'll put this again. This will go on a, on a list, which I'll tell you how to get to. There's a great journal called Environmental Health Sciences, which is published by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which does fantastic stories about chemical contamination, for example. And now that we're in Brazil or anywhere, I, just, I looked at it last night. can't put it up there because of the Internet. But what's interesting is the cover story today uh, it's a monthly magazine, scientific, peer-reviewed magazine, it is essentially about the um, transgenerational passage of chemical contaminants from, uh, they list specifically, uh, two, two uh, additives for plastics, which are uh, BPA, which some of you, bisphenol A it's called, and the other is phthalates, phthalates and bisphenol A, and this study, again, with the backing of the, some of the biggest research institutions in the United States, behind it, 
suggesting that uh, certainly in animal studies at this point, there seem to be indications that a, a contamination of a parent will be passed along to its offspring. You go to that, you can go to that today. It's the October 2013 issue, and any one of you could turn that into a story. I guarantee you have a lot of this phthalate and BPA in whatever country you're from. You could take that, that study, turn it into a story, and in like three days you'd have, a, you'd have a major story. So I encourage you to actually get familiar with these kind of uh, um, 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 sources. Um, I did this in, with this book. I wrote, uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago. It came out. It's called Exposed, the Toxic Chemistry of, of uh, Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. And it was a book in which I explored um, what the implications were as the uh, 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 European Union banned a whole bunch of chemicals because they have much more rigid controls than the United States, and what that meant for the products coming into America, one sentence, Products banned in the European Union because of their chemical dangers are now being imported into the United States where they're perfectly legal. And I would bet they are also being imported into your countries wherever you are, including Brazil. So essentially you have products being imported into Brazil that are illegal in the European Union. And that's what essentially this book talks about, is how this creates this, um, this uh, phenomenon. Um, okay. And um, my final word is that um, all stories are ultimately international stories. I hope you think that way. I hope you all come to an environmental collaboration workshop we're going to have tomorrow at uh, 4 o'clock. And uh, we're talking about how to collaborate across international frontiers on these kind of um, uh, environmental investigations. So um, thank you very much. And the uh, next person on the podium is uh, Gustavo Paleros. Uh, we'll see if we can get your presentation up here. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, I'm from Brazil, but I'm, I'm going to speak in English. I think it's going to be a little bit easier for not having everybody turning into their phones. So welcome to Rio. I'm from Sao Paulo, but Rio, it's a, it's a good postcard for, for Brazil. And so, uh, oh yeah, we're here. Uh, what I'm going to talk today about is the work we've been doing um, within this organization, which is based in Rio. It's called OECO. It's a nonprofit environmental news agent where I'm part of, but uh, uh, we do in partnership with the International Center of Journalists based in DC. And the work we're doing we call like the Environmental News Innovation Lab. And why we're doing this lab uh, is, is a story that goes back to 2008 when we started doing a lot of uh, work with uh, digital mapping and, and data uh, for exposing some of the issues that we have here in Brazil. At that time, we were not calling ourselves of data journalists. I, I don't think the, the expression existed at that time. We, were, uh, we started everything by using data of uh, forest fires or uh, hot spots, as the correct term goes, coming from satellites and doing kind of data crushing uh, with uh, protected areas of Brazil. So we're not talking uh, pretty much about this classical investigative thing of exposing some uh, uh, secret data set, but much more of finding large amounts of data, which is pretty much the case about uh, fire, that you have daily data coming out of satellites, uh, and crushing this data with uh, support of tools like Google Earth to see some trends. So that's what, where we started doing this uh, data journalism for, for environment. And after doing this for five years and already being classified as a data, a data journalist, we realized that we could do this in, and we needed to do in a much more quick pace. So that's why we created a lab for having a team uh, of developers and the classical thing that everybody now talks about data journalists, that you have, you, you, 
you have to have this multidisciplinary team. So in our teams, we have a, an engineer which takes care of the database. We have two developers. We have an artist who does the kind of design kind of things because we need to kind of follow the pace of the news to put together these news applications. I'm going to talk more about that. So what is the new uh, the Ecolab? So it's a project done by, by OECO, which is this non-profit uh, environmental news, uh, news agency in Brazil, and the International Center for Journalists via uh, the Knight International Journalist Fellowship, which basically uh, supports my work within this project. So what do we do in this? We do a lot of work with data, data maps and news apps. Well, news apps, I don't know if you're familiar with this term, but it stands for tools in general. But tools done by um, media organization as, as ours. So the way we see ourselves, of course, we, we like to do the best part of the, of the job, which is doing the investigation and putting the stories and getting the, 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 the impact, like the stories we're telling about your countries. Uh, but we see ourselves also in a position that we can support uh, the journalists of OECO to do their own investigations, but putting together large amounts of data together. So we do a lot of work of aggregating data sets, data crunching, and creating visualizations for that to help uh, people to, to understand better uh, the stories. So what are we doing? As I stated there, we're pushing for applying new technology for sourcing and producing uh, environmental journalism. Uh, and, and I put it that as well because we feel, as I said, when we started these things, we were not saying like we are the data journalists, you know. We just were doing and then suddenly there was some, some people saying like, yeah, there's this thing called data journalists. And we said, well, yeah, I think we do that. And so we can call ourselves data journalists. But for, for me, as a personal opinion, data journalists is more than a new kind of academic branch, although there is already masters course in the City University of London on, in data journalism, I see a lot of, of, of this as an innovation process that is happening on all the chain of, of sourcing information, producing, and for me the most exciting part now is distributing the information. So I'm going to talk about the partnerships we've been doing with other news agents besides OECO to uh, allow them to use the tools we're creating and we want them to use uh, uh, things uh, in a partnership way. So that's our board of how we work. We have a couple of projects and we try to deliver them in time. Uh, so our main project, you might have seen, is Info Amazonia, which is a platform which aggregates data and stories uh, about the Amazon region, not only in Brazil, but in the nine countries of the Amazon. So it, this is Actually, I think a good job to do in Brazil because Brazilians tend to think the Amazon is just theirs, but it, it is a, a region which has nine countries in it and, and it's huge, as you know. So infamazonia.org is our main project. What do we have in, in it? So as I said, we, uh, we would like to see, and that's what we try to do, to Info Amazonia as a data mining platform. We aggregate loads, loads of data there, and with um, not much training, actually, with some effort, journalists can find a couple of stories um, on, on Info Amazonia. So this is the classical map of the first station. So we have data, for example, from Brazil about the first station since 1976. So you can see the trends of, of the first station in, in, in the Amazon region. And since last year, we did a partnership with a system of, which is done by some NGOs. It's called Terra I, which uh, has data of deforestation for the other eight countries in the Amazon. And we include also like cattle ranching and timber, uh, timber clusters. So in, in order to allow uh, the thing, uh, the thing I'm, I'm saying here, the data mining uh, process of people saying like, well, there is uh, cattle ranching production in this region and it, there is a lot of deforestation there since the 70s. And then we start asking these questions, why? You know, should I go there and write a story? And, and that's when, when we started to think like cartographers, actually, like uh, journalists who think that they, by piling up layers of information, you actually can get something else. We start calling what are we doing, not more data journalists, but geojournalism. It is also, I admit, an attempt to create a fence term, 
and to create a brand and something. I'm going to tell you more of a product that we have with this term. But we see that it's very effective in a way, as I'm saying, like, think about the cartographer. Think about creating layers of information and putting yourself as one more layer of information on this. And, and the binder of this information is the geographical coordinates. So it's, it's a location. Everything has a location. So if I'm here in this uh, gymnasium and I'm writing a story here, I want to know what is the sanitation, what is the supply of water here? What's the population income here? What is the pollution of this? So we start like bringing uh, science information <coughs> as a layer that's going to create context to your story and the other way around. It's kind of a dialogue between your story and the data because your story gives, although not everybody agrees with that, context to data as well. So that's uh, deforestation. Uh, other major data sets that we have, oil and mining concessions for the nine countries. So who owns the blocks? What are the minerals explored within national parks? So this is the classical example of the moment. I don't know if you know the story about Yasuni National Park in Ecuador, where the president of Ecuador just decided after saying that nobody uh, gives him money to not explore, that he's going to explore the oil underneath. So we showed who owns the, uh, the block of oil in, inside the park. Uh, if there is indigenous population, we also show who are the indigenous population there, how many people live in, within that area. And these the small white dots that you see on the maps are the stories. And the way we do, I'm going to talk more, is not just our stories. We try to source every story, and I'm going to talk more about that. So what else we have, just for you to have an idea of, of, the, of the, the platform, we have hydroelectric power plant data for the nine countries. We have protected areas in indigenous territories for the nine countries, the roads of the nine countries, and the forest fire for the nine countries. Again, not, none of this data is some secret uh, CIA data set that we have to do, like hacking. It might be the case, but it's more acting as a data organizer and going out and finding out where these data are and putting together in a meaningful way and distributing in a meaningful way, which are maps, visualization. And a lot of this data, for example, for the other countries, included negotiation with the governments, not because, uh, again, they're secret data, but just because they are not uh, available in an easy format. They're in PDFs, they're uh, hiding in some kind of crazy uh, drive, and, and you have to go there and say, like, look, for me as a journalist to tell the story behind this data, I just need you a best format for it. So it, it's this process that I think is important as well. So getting back to the geojournalist thing, what do we do in terms of aggregating stories? Uh, uh, there is this thing that I mentioned, like we're trying to create a layer of stories that are all geotagged. And by using the coordinates as a binder, which makes the stories significant or contextual for the data layers, you actually transform the, the large data set of stories as something as a geographical layer as well. So uh, the way we do, we scan the internet. We have uh, two people who do this. We do Google alerts and everything. We try to find everything besides the stories that we produce ourselves, uh, which is published about the Amazon. If someone publishes a story in the Washington Post or the New York Times, we, we, we put there and we ask people to send. We allow people to submit stories. You can go, if you write a story, journalist, we incentivize journalists who write about the Amazon to go to our platform and say, like, I want to include my story in the data set of Info Amazonia. So, so far we have a thousand stories, all of them with uh, geotagged stories, and we generate an API, uh, application programming interface, of these stories already with the geolocation on it, which means we have RSS as well, which means that if you get this API, this GeoJSON file that it's kind of hidden, we, we're going to do a better job to show that. But if you get that, you can do transform the stories, the data sets that we organize and geotag as a mobile application if you want, or do a website about the stories of Amazon, analysis, maybe you analyze some words and see who is writing about more countries. We, we haven't done this analysis ourselves, but we're promoting this as, as a way of seeing the layer of, of journalist coverage also as something to be investigated. What people 
in different countries are talking about the Amazon. Is Ecuador publishing enough stories about the story of Yasuni or Brazil? It's publishing at, at some point that block of oil within, within, the, within Yasuni was owned by Petrobras until they left. Now it's owned by the government of Ecuador. And, uh, but I think the, beauty, the beautiful thing that also you can put here is, is a layer of precision. So, so far, if we were talking about this huge region of the Amazon, and I said, let's geotag one story. Maybe this story is going to fall down like on the provincial layer, like, well, this happens in Madre de Dios. So we put it there in the center of Madre de Dios. But the thing we try to do, and this uh, means resources, is to have people on the ground with GPS on the areas where things are happening. Because then we get a real geo-precision of the story. So if I look at the Infamazon and there is a deforestation going on, and I said, go there and see what happens. You're really adding something meaningful. You're taking pictures, you're taking pictures, videos. You're adding information to the data. You're verifying information which comes from satellites, basically. So f from this experience, we're moving to promote this in other places. So by doing Infamazonia, we created this thing. It's called GEL with J. It's a funny name, but it, I think it stands for we, we make a joke, it's not true, it's a journalist Earth observation, totally not true. <laughs> but that's GEL, which is a WordPress uh, platform which allows you doing the, exactly the same thing we're doing in the Amazon in any region of the world. So you get this thing, you download it, install it in your computer, which what it GEL does. So if you get this uh, URL, you can see the, uh, the website of the, of the WordPress team. But what this uh, tool does? He published map layers direct on WordPress. It means like you can com combine layers. You can publish your map directly on WordPress. I, I won't go much in detail, but if you know WordPress, you see that it's quite uh, innovative. You're not getting an iframe of Google Maps, if you know how this works, but you're actually creating the map directly on WordPress, depending on the layers you use. If you want to know more about it, uh, I can tell you. And every post, as we do, can be geotagged. So you, everything that you put, you put, well, this goes for this location, this goes for this other location. So you create a location for every post. And, and, and the other thing is very focused on allowing distribution. Because we realized on, on Info Amazonia that the best thing for us was not like promoting the website and say like, come and see our website, which is beautiful and we want one million hits. No, the best way for us to work was working like the YouTube platform or Google Maps, the API thing. We allow people to get the maps, customize the journalists, we do partnerships with other media, and they take our maps to their pages. That's the way we're getting audience. Because every time someone see our maps in another page, we're still counting the audience. It's like a YouTube video. So that's what GEL does. And that's the first project that we're doing with uh, my friend Fiona, which is here. Hi, Fiona. Fiona is a very experienced uh, South African uh, environmental journalist. So we partnered and we launching today a Oxpeckers, which is our first project which uh, investigates the links of rhino uh, killing and ivory trafficking between South Africa and other countries. Um, so if you go to this website, let us know if you find any problem, but we, we think it's everything good for this launching. Uh, so we do, uh, like we did in, in, in Infamazonia, a map where we track data from the government on killing of rhinos. So these red balls that you see there count the, 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 uh, the killing of the rhinos. If you change, uh, it's not online here, but if you change, you can see also how many poachers were arrested in different areas of the country in South Africa. And you have a, an additional layer of stories. So what Fiona and her team are doing, they are both managing the data sets that are coming from the government and up, updating every month, as we do in Info Amazonia, the data about the, the, the rhino counting, uh, the rhino deaths, and also scanning uh, the internet and the social media to find reports, because the government doesn't report on daily basis. So if you get uh, daily reports on social media, like I saw a rhino death, or there's something published on the media, also becomes a layer, a geotag layer of, of, of Oxpeckers. 
So that's the first project we're launching with Jell, and Fiona is here also to tell us tell us more about it if you want. And another product that it's we created of out of the the Ecolab as a result of this this as the Geojournalist Handbook. Uh, so it's, I should have put the 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 link here, but if you search on Google for Geojournalist Handbook, it's it's kind of a trying to create this community and, and uh, putting some some more uh, concrete uh, knowledge on the paper of this working we've been doing. So things you find here so far, it was launched last month. It's 11 tutorials from how you choose the best maps to go in your story. Sources for environmental uh, uh, data, like earth data science. Se up to how to create a balloon for taking aerial pictures for a story. So we, we're trying to source different experts for people who work with uh, kind of environmental earth data things to put together on this, on, on this handbook. So we have experts from, for, from four, four different continents. And all the content is Creative Commons, so you can also, it's translated so far in Portuguese and in English, so, but you can easily take and share. What is the next project that we, we're creating within the, Eco, the, the Ecolab? Um, again, with partnerships, we're partnering with the Publica. I don't know if you've seen any uh, presentations from them here. Uh, they're also a, a, a non-profit news agents following the model of a Publica in the U.S. They do really... Uh, deep stuff on investigating companies more large uh, long pieces so we partner with them to investigate we actually launching this week the first uh, stories the uh, BNDS is the National Bank of Development of Brazil who is funding most of the of the hydroelectric power plants roads and gas and oil operations in Brazil in the Amazon of Brazil and outside of Brazil the thing is you get the data from Brazil, but you don't get the data, although the money is ours, of the other countries. So we're trying to expose this data, and at the same time, <coughs> sorry, the work that we're doing in the Ecolab is creating this platform which will allow you to do these connections. Again, we're working pretty much on the side of supporting the journalists to, to find the data and do their own stories. In this case, a public is doing the stories. And a big step that we want to uh, give on, on Infamazonia is, remember that I said the beautiful thing that we would like to do is to have people on the ground reporting. We've done that, for example, last year in Ecuador, we have a, a photographer and video maker going a month doing an expedition and geotagging every picture, and he did the documentary. It was great. But this is very res resource intensive. And so we want to create a citizen journalist a platform or a gateway we're calling citizen desk of Infamazonia to reach out other uh, people who are living in the Amazon and has some journalistic skills or wanted to have and needed to be trained or would like to be trained to contribute to Infamazonia. Because in order uh, to have the, the right scale of the work that we want to do, we will need uh, a help of citizens to verify data, to tell the stories behind these really large data sets, these large uh, regions. So this is probably going to happen next year. So. Thank you for your attention. This is the, the website of the Ecolab, ecolab.oeco.org.br. My email, I'm happy to, to contact with you, and my Twitter. Okay, thank you. Bye.